This is pages 76 to 93 of The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walsh. As you read today, think about how the author uses point of view to capture Jeanette's experiences as a child. Page 76. Once mom started teaching, I thought maybe we'd be able to buy new clothes, eat cafeteria lunches, and even spring for nifty extras like the class pictures the school took every year. Mom and dad had never been able to buy the class pictures for us, though a couple of times, mom secretly snipped out a snapshot of the packet before returning it. Despite mom's salary, we didn't buy the class pictures that year, or even steal them, but that was probably just as well. Mom had read somewhere that mayonnaise was good for your hair, and the morning the photographer was coming to school, she slathered a few spoonfuls on mine. She didn't realize you were supposed to wash out the mayonnaise, and in the picture that year, I was peering out from under one stiff shingle of hair. Still, things did improve. Even though Dad had been fired from the barite mine, we were able to continue living in the depot by paying rent to the mining company, since not a lot of other families were vying for the place. We now had food in the fridge, at least until it got toward the end of the month, when we usually ran out of money because neither Mom nor Dad ever mastered the art of budgeting. But Mom's salary created a whole new set of problems. While Dad liked it that Mom was bringing home a paycheck, he saw himself as the head of the household, and he maintained that the money should be turned over to him. It was his responsibility, he'd say, to handle the family finances. And he needed money to fund his gold-leaching research. The only research you're doing is on the liver's capacity to absorb alcohol, Mom said. Still, she found it hard to straight out defy Dad. For some reason, she didn't have it in her to say no to him. If she tried, he'd argue and wheedle and sulk and bully and plain wear her down. So she resorted to evasive tactics. She'd tell Dad she hadn't cashed her paycheck yet, or she'd pretend she'd left it at school and hide it until she could sneak off to the bank. Then she'd pretend she'd lost all the money. Pretty soon, Dad took to showing up at school on payday, waiting outside in the car, and taking us all straight to Winnemucca, where the bank was located, so Mom could cash her paycheck immediately. Dad insisted on escorting Mom into the bank. Mom had us kids come along so she could try to slip some of the cash to us first. Back in the car, Dad would go through Mom's purse and take the money out. On one trip, Mom went into the bank alone because Dad couldn't find a place to park. When she came out, she was missing a sock. Jeanette, I'm going to give you a sock that I want you to put in a safe place, Mom said once she got in the car. She winked hard at me as she reached inside her bra and pulled out her other sock, knitted in the middle and bulging at the toe. Hide it where no one can get it, because you know how scarce socks can get in our house. God damn it, Rosemary, Dad snapped. Do you think I'm a fucking idiot? What? Mom asked, throwing her arms up in the air. Am I not allowed to give my daughter a sock? She winked at me again, just in case I didn't get it. Back in Battle Mountain, Dad insisted we go to the Owl Club to celebrate payday and ordered steaks for all of us. They tasted so good we forgot we were eating a week's worth of groceries. Hey, Mountain Goat, Dad said at the end of the dinner, while Mom was putting our table scraps in her purse. Why don't you let me borrow that sock for a second? I looked around the table. No one met my eye except Dad, who was grinning like an alligator. I handed over the sock. Mom gave a dramatic sigh of defeat and let her head drop down on the table. To show who was in charge, Dad left the waitress a $10 tip, but on the way out, Mom slipped it into her purse. Pause here, make a quick annotation before we move on to the next section. Soon we were out of money again. When Dad dropped Brian and me off at school, he noticed that we weren't carrying lunch bags. Where are your lunches? Dad asked us. We looked at each other and shrugged. There's no food in the house, Brian said. When Dad heard that, he acted outraged, as though he'd learned for the first time that his children were going hungry. Damn it, that Rosemary keeps spending money on art supplies, he muttered, pretending to be talking to himself. Then he declared more loudly, no child of mine has to go hungry. After he dropped us off, he called after us. Don't you kids worry about a thing. At lunch, Brian and I sat together in the cafeteria. I was pretending to help him with his homework so that no one would ask us why we weren't eating when Dad appeared in the doorway, carrying a big grocery bag. I saw him scanning the room, looking for us. My youngins forgot to take their lunch to school today, he announced to the teacher on cafeteria duty as he walked toward us. 
He set the bag down on the table in front of Brian and me and took out a loaf of bread, a whole package of bologna, a jar of mayonnaise, a half-gallon jug of orange juice, two apples, a jar of pickles, and two candy bars. "'Have I ever let you down?' he asked Brian and me, and then turned and walk, walked away. In a voice so low that Dad didn't hear him, Brian said, "'Yes.'" Dad has to start carrying his weight, Lori said, as she stared into the empty refrigerator. He does, I said. He brings in money from odd jobs. He spends more than he earns on booze, Brian said. He was whittling, the shavings falling to the floor right outside the kitchen, where we were standing. Brian had taken to carrying a pocket knife with him at all times, and he often whittled pieces of scrap wood when he was working something out in his head. It's not all for booze, I said. Most of it's for research on cyanide leaching. Dad doesn't need to do research on, on leeching, Brian said. He's an expert. He and Lori cracked up. I glared at them. I knew more about Dad's situation than they did because he talked to me more than anyone else in the family. We'd still go demon hunting in the desert, for old time's sake, since by then I was seven and too grown up to believe in demons. Dad told me all about his plans and he showed me his pages of graphs and calculations and geological charts depicting the layers of sediment where the gold was buried. He told me I was his favorite child, but he made me promise not to tell Lori or Brian or Maureen. It was our secret. I swear, honey, there are times when I think you're the only one around who still has faith in me, he said. I don't know what I'd do if you'd ever lost it. I told him that I would never lose faith in him, and I promised myself I never would. Pause here. Make a quick annotation before we move on to the next section. A few months after Mom had started working as a teacher, Brian and I passed by the Green Lantern. The clouds above the setting sun were streaked scarlet and purple. The temperature was dropping quickly, from searing hot to chilly within a matter of minutes, like it always did in the desert at dusk. A woman with a fringed shawl draped over her shoulders was smoking a, a cigarette on the Green Lantern's front porch. She waved at Brian, but he didn't wave back. Yoo-hoo! Brian, it's me, sugar! Ginger! she called. Brian ignored her. Who's that? I asked. Some friend of dad's, he said. She's dumb. Why is she dumb? She doesn't even know all the words in the sad sack comic book, Brian said. He told me that dad had taken him out for his birthday a while back. In the drugstore, dad had let Brian pick out whatever present he wanted, so Brian chose a sad sack comic book. Then they went to the Nevada Hotel, which was near the Owl Club, and had a sign outside saying, Bar, Grill, Clean, Modern. They had dinner with Ginger, who kept laughing and talking real loud and touching both Dad and Brian. Then all three climbed the stairs to one of the hotel rooms. It was a suite with a small front room and a bedroom. Dad and Ginger went into the bedroom, while Brian stayed in the front room and read his new comic book. Later, when Dad and Ginger came out, she sat down next to Brian. He didn't look up. He kept staring at the comic book, even though he'd already read it all the way through twice. Ginger declared that she loved Sad Sack. So Dad made Brian give Ginger the comic book, telling him it was the gentlemanly thing to do. It was mine, Brian said, and she kept asking me to read the bigger words. She's a grown-up and she can't even read a comic book. Brian had taken such a powerful dislike to Ginger that I realized she must have done something more than Shanghai as comic book. I wondered if he had figured out something about Ginger and the other ladies at the Green Lantern. Maybe he knew why Mom said they were bad. Maybe that was why he was mad. Did you learn what they do inside the Green Lantern? I asked. Brian stared off ahead. I tried to see what he was looking at, but there was nothing there except for the Tuscarora Mountains rising up to meet the darkening sky. Then he shook his head. She makes a lot of money, he said, and she should buy her own darn comic book. Pause here. Please fill out your table of contents for page 80 using the sentence starter on the next slide. Page 81. Some people like to make fun of Battle Mountain. A big newspaper out east once held a contest to find the ugliest, most forlorn, most godforsaken town in the whole country, and it declared Battle Mountain the winner. The people who lived there didn't hold it in much regard either. They'd point to the big yellow and red sign way up on a pole at the Shell Station, the one with the burned-out S, and say with a sort of perverse pride, Yep, 
that's where we live. Hell. But I was happy in Battle Mountain. We'd been there for nearly a year and I considered it home, the first real home I could remember. Dad was on the verge of perfecting his cyanide gold process. Brian and I had the desert, Lori and Mom painted and read together, and Maureen, who had silky, white blonde hair and a whole gang of imaginary friends, was happy running around with no diaper on. I thought our days of packing up and driving off in the middle of the night were over. Just after my eighth birthday, Billy Deal and his dad moved into the tracks. Billy was three years older than me, tall and skinny with a sandy crew cut and blue eyes. But he wasn't handsome. The thing about Billy was that he had a lopsided head. Bertha Whitefoot, a half-Indian woman who lived in a shack near the depot and kept about 50 dogs fenced in her yard, said it was because Billy's mom hadn't turned him over at all when he was a baby. He just lay there in the same position, day in and day out, and the side of his head that was pressed against the mattress got a little flat. You didn't notice it at all that much unless you looked at him straight on, and not a lot of people did, because Billy was always moving around like he was itchy. He kept his Marlboros rolled up in one of his t-shirt sleeves, and he lit his cigarettes with a Zippo lighter stamped with a picture of a naked lady bending over. Billy lived with his dad in a house made of tar paper and corrugated tin, down the tracks from our house. He never mentioned his mom and made it clear that you weren't supposed to bring her up, so I never knew if she had run off or died. His dad worked in the barite mine and spent the evenings at the Owl Club, so Billy had a lot of unsupervised time on his hands. Bertha Whitefoot took to calling Billy the devil with a crew cut and the terror of the tracks. She claimed he set fire to a couple of her dogs and skinned some neighborhood cats and strung their naked pink bodies up on a clothesline to make jerky. Billy said Bertha was a big fat liar. I didn't know whom to believe. After all, Billy was a certified J.D., juvenile delinquent. He had told us that he had spent time in a detention center in Reno for shoplifting and vandalizing cars. Shortly after he moved to the tracks, Billy started following me around. He was always looking at me and telling the other kids he was my boyfriend. No, he's not, I would yell, though I secretly liked it that he wanted to be. A few months after he had moved to town, Billy told me he wanted to show me something really funny. If it's a skinned cat, I don't want to see it, I said. No, nah, it ain't nothing like that, he said. It's really funny. You'll laugh and laugh, I promise. Unless you're scared. Of course I'm not scared, I said. The funny thing Billy wanted to show me was in his house, which was dark inside and smelled like pee and was even messier than our house, although in a different way. Our house is filled with stuff. Papers, books, tools, lumber, paintings, art supplies, and statues of Venus de Milo painted in all different colors. There was hardly anything in Billy's house. No furniture. Not even wooden spool tables. It had only one room with two mattresses on the floor next to a TV. There was nothing on the walls, not a single painting or drawing. A naked light bulb hung from the ceiling, right next to three or four dangling spiral strips of fly paper, so thick with flies that you couldn't see the sticky yellow surface underneath. Empty beer cans and whiskey bottles and a few half-eaten tins of Vienna sausages littered the floor. On one of the mattresses, Billy's father was snoring unevenly. His mouth hung open, and flies were gathered in the stubble of his beard. A wet stain had darkened his pants nearly to his knees. His zipper was undone, and his gross penis dangled to one side. I stared quietly, then asked, "'What's the funny thing?' "'Don't you see?' said Billy, pointing at his dad. "'He pissed himself!' Billy started laughing. I felt my face turning hot. "'You're not supposed to laugh at your own father,' I said. "'Ever!' Aw, oh, now, don't go get how high and mighty on me, Billy said. Don't go and try and pretend you're better than me, because I know your daddy ain't nothing but a drunk like mine. I hated Billy in that moment. I really did. I thought of telling him about binary numbers and the glass castle and Venus and all the things that made my dad special and completely different from his dad, but I knew Billy wouldn't understand. I started to run out of the house, but then I stopped and turned around. My daddy is nothing like your daddy, I shouted. When my daddy passes out, he never pisses himself. Pause here and write a quick annotation before we move on to the next section. At dinner that night, I started telling everyone about Billy Deal's disgusting dad and the ugly dump they lived in. Mom put down her fork. Jeanette, I'm disappointed in you, she said. You should show more compassion. Why? I said. He's bad. He's a JD. 
No child is born a delinquent, Mom said. They only become that way, she went on, if nobody loved them when they were kids. Unloved children go grow up to become serial murderers or alcoholics. Mom looked pointedly at Dad and then back at me. She told me I should try to be nicer to Billy. He doesn't have all the advantages you kids do, she said. The next time I saw Billy, I told him I'd be his friend, but not his girlfriend, if he promised not to make fun of anyone's dad. Billy promised, but he kept trying to be my boyfriend. He told me that if I'd be his girlfriend, he would always protect me and make sure nothing bad ever happened to me and buy me expensive presents. If I wouldn't be his girlfriend, he said, I'd be sorry. I told him if he didn't want to be just friends, fine with me. I wasn't scared of him. After about a week, I was hanging out with some other kids from the tracks, watching garbage burn in a big rusty trash can. They were all throwing in pieces of brush to keep the fire going, plus chunks of tire treads, and we cheered at the thick black rubber smoke that made our noses sting as it rolled past us into the air. Billy came up to me and pulled my arm, motioning me away from the other kids. He dug into his pocket and pulled out a turquoise and silver ring. It's for you, he said. I took it and turned it over in my hand. Mom had a collection of turquoise and silver Indian jewelry that she kept at Grandma's house, so Dad wouldn't pawn it. Most of it was antique and very valuable. Some man from a museum in Phoenix kept trying to buy pieces from her. And when we visited Grandma, Mom wouldn't let me and Lori put on the heavy necklaces and bracelets and concha belts. Billy's ring looked like one of Mom's. I ran it across my teeth and tongue like Mom had taught me to do. I could tell by the slightly bitter taste that it was real silver. Where did you get this? I asked. It used to be my mom's, Billy said. It sure was a pretty ring. It had a simple thin band and an oval-shaped piece of dark turquoise held in place by snaking silver strands. I didn't have any jewelry, and it had been a long time since anyone had given me a present except for the planet Venus. I tried on the ring. It was way too big for my finger, but I could wrap yarn around the band the way the high school girls did when they wore their boyfriend's rings. I was afraid, however, that if I took the ring, Billy might start thinking that I had agreed to be his girlfriend. He'd tell all the other kids, and if I said it wasn't true, he'd point to the ring. On the other hand, I figured Mom would approve, since accepting it would make Billy feel good about himself. I decided to compromise. I'll keep it, I said, but I'm not going to wear it. Billy's smile spread all across his face. But don't think this means we're boyfriend and girlfriend, I said, and don't think this means you can kiss me. Pause here. Read a quick annotation before we move on to the next section. I didn't tell anyone about the ring, not even Brian. I kept it in my pants pocket during the day, and at night, I hid it in the bottom of the cardboard box where I kept my clothes. But Billy Deal had to go and shoot his mouth off about giving me the ring. He started telling the other kids things like, how, as soon as I was old enough, me and him were going to get married. When I found out what he was saying, I knew accepting the ring had been a big mistake. I also knew I should return it, but I didn't. I meant to, and every morning I'd put it in my pocket with the intention of giving it back, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. That ring was too darn pretty. A few weeks later, I was playing hide-and-seek along the tracks with some of the neighborhood kids. I found the perfect hiding place, a small tool shed behind a clump of sagebrush that no one had hidden before. But just as the kid who was it was finished counting, the door opened and someone else tried to get in. It was Billy Deal. He hadn't even been playing with us. You can't hide with me, I hissed at him. You're supposed to find your own place. It's too late, he said. He's almost done counting. Billy crawled inside. The shed was tiny with barely enough room for one person to fit in, crouched over. I wasn't about to say so, but being that close to Billy scared me. It's too crowded, I whispered. You gotta leave. No, Billy said. We can fit. He rearranged his legs so they were pressed up against mine. We were so close I could feel his breath on my face. It's too crowded, I said again. And you're breathing on me. He pretended not to hear me. You know what they do in the Green Lantern, don't you? He asked. I could hear the muffled shouts of the other kids being chased by the boy who was it. I wished I hadn't chosen such a good hiding place. Sure, I said. What? The women are nice to the men. But what do they do? He paused. See, you don't know. I do, I said. Want me to tell you? I want you to find your own hiding place. They start by kissing, he said. Ever kissed anyone? 
In the narrow rays of light that shot through the gaps in the sides of the shed, I could see the rings of dirt around his skinny neck. Of course I have. Lots of times. Who? My dad. Your dad doesn't count. Someone not in your family, and with your eyes closed. It doesn't count unless your eyes are closed. I told Billy that was about the dumbest thing I'd ever heard. If your eyes were closed, you couldn't see who you were kissing. Billy said there was an awful lot about men and women I didn't know. He said some men stuck knives into women while they were kissing them, especially if the women were being mean and didn't want to be kissed. But he told me he'd never do that to me. He put his face up next to mine. Close your eyes, he said. No way, I said. Billy smushed his face against mine, then grabbed my hair and made my head bend sideways and stuck his tongue in my mouth. It was slimy and disgusting, but when I tried to pull away, he pushed in toward me. The more I pulled, the more he pushed until he was on top of me, and I felt his fingers tugging at my shorts. His other hand was unbuttoning his own pants. To stop him, I put my hand down there, and when I touched it, I knew what it was, even though I had never touched one before. I couldn't knee him in the groin like Dad had told me to do if a guy jumped on me, because my knees were outside his legs, so I bit him hard on the ear. It must have hurt, because he yelled and hit me in the face. Blood started gushing out of my nose. The other kids heard the ruckus and came running. One of them opened the shed door, and Billy and I scrambled out, pulling on our own clothes. I kissed Jeanette, Billy yelled. Did not, I said. He's a liar. We just got into a fight. That's all. He was a liar, I told myself all the rest of the day. I hadn't really kissed him, or at least it didn't count. My eyes had been open the entire time. Pause here and write an annotation before we move on to the next section. The next day, I took the ring to Billy Deal's house. I found him out back, sitting in an abandoned car. Its red paint had been bleached by the desert sun and had turned orange along the rusting trim. The tires had collapsed a long time ago, and the black rag roof was peeling. Billy was sitting in the driver's seat, making engine noises in his throat and pretending to work a phantom stick shift. I stood nearby, waiting for him to acknowledge me. He didn't, so I spoke first. I don't want to be your friend, I said, and I don't want your ring anymore. I don't care, he said. I don't want it either. He kept looking straight ahead through the cracked windshield. I reached through the open window, dropped the ring in his lap, and turned and walked away. I heard the click and clunk of the car door opening and closing behind me. I kept walking. Then I felt a sharp sting on the back of my head as if a little rock had hit me. Billy had thrown the ring at me. I kept walking. Guess what, Billy shouted. I raped you. I turned around and saw him standing there by the car, looking hurt and angry but not as tall as usual. I searched my mind for a cutting comment back, but since I didn't know what rape meant, all I could think to say was, BIG DEAL! At home, I looked up the word in the dictionary. Then I looked up the words that explained it, and though I still couldn't figure out completely, I knew it wasn't good. Usually, when I didn't understand a word, I'd ask Dad about it, and we'd read the definition together and discuss it. I didn't want to do that now. I had a hunch it would cause problems. Pause here and please fill out the table of contents for pages 86 to 87 before we move on to the next section. The next day, Lori, Brian, and I were sitting at one of the spool tables in the depot playing five-card draw and keeping an eye on Maureen while Mom and Dad spent some downtime at the Owl Club. We heard Billy Deal outside, calling my name. Lori looked at me and I shook my head. We went back to our card game, but Billy kept on, so Lori went out on the porch, which was the old platform where people used to board the train, and told Billy to go away. She came back in and said, He's got a gun. Lori picked up Maureen. One of the windows shattered and then Billy appeared framed in it. He used the butt of his rifle to knock out the remaining pieces of glass, then pointed the barrel inside. It's just a BB gun, Brian said. I told you you'd be sorry, Billy said to me and pulled the trigger. It felt like a wasp had stung me in the ribs. Billy started firing at us all, working the pump action quickly back and forth between each shot. Brian pushed over the spool table and we all crouched behind it. The BBs pinged off the tabletop. Maureen was howling. I turned to Lori, who was the oldest and in charge. She was biting her lower lip, thinking. She handed Maureen to me and took off running across the room. Billy got her once or twice. Brian stood up to try to draw the fire, but she made it upstairs to the second floor. 
Then she came down again. She had dad's pistol, and she pointed it dead at Billy. That's just a toy, Billy said, but his voice was a little shaky. It's real, all right, I shouted. It's my dad's gun. If it is, he said, she ain't got the cajones to use it. Try me, Lori told him. Go on then, Billy said. Shoot me and see what happens. Lori wasn't as good a shot as me, but she pointed the gun in Billy's general direction and pulled the trigger. I squeezed my eyes shut at the explosion, and when I opened them, Billy had disappeared. We all ran outside, wondering if Billy's blood-soaked body would be lying on the ground, but he had ducked under the window. When he saw us, he hightailed it down the street along the tracks. He got about 50 yards away and started shooting at us again with his BB gun. I yanked the pistol out of Lori's hand, aimed low, and pulled the trigger. I was too carried away to hold the gun the way Dad had taught me, and the recoil nearly pulled my shoulder out of its socket. The dirt kicked up a few feet in front of Billy. He jumped what seemed about three feet up in the air and broke into a dead run down the tracks. We all started laughing, but it seemed funny only for a second or two, and then we stood there looking at one another in silence. I realized my hand was shaking so bad I could hardly hold the gun. A little while later, a squad car pulled up outside the depot, and Mom and Dad got out. Their faces were grave. An officer got out also and walked alongside them to the door. We kids were all sitting inside on the benches, wearing polite, respectful expressions. The officer looked at each of us individually, as if counting us. I clasped my hands in my lap to show I was well-behaved. Dad squatted in front of us, one knee to the floor, his arms folded across the other knee, cowboy style. So what happened here? he asked. It was self-defense, I piped up. Dad had always said that self-defense was a justifiable reason for shooting someone. I see, Dad said. The policeman told us that some of the neighbors had reported seeing kids shooting guns at each other, and he wanted to know what had happened. We tried to explain that Billy had started it, that we'd been provoked, and we were defending ourselves and didn't even aim to kill, but the cop wasn't interested in the nuances of the situation. He told Dad that the whole family would need to come down to the courthouse the next morning and see the magistrate. Billy Deal and his dad would be there, too. The magistrate would get to the bottom of the matter and decide what measures needed to be taken. "'Are we going to be sent away?' Brian asked the officer. "'That's up to the magistrate,' he said. That night, Mom and Dad spent a long time upstairs talking in low voices while we kids lay in our boxes. Finally, late in the evening, they came down, their faces still grave. "'We're going to Phoenix.' Dad said. When? I asked. Tonight. Pause here and write an annotation before we move on to the next section. Dad allowed each of us to bring only one thing. I ran outside with a paper bag to gather up my favorite rocks. When I returned, holding the heavy bag at the bottom so it wouldn't split, Dad and Brian were arguing over the plastic jack-o'-lantern filled with green plastic army soldiers that Brian wanted to bring. You're bringing toys? Dad asked. You said I could take one thing, and this is my thing, Brian said. This is my one thing, I said, holding up the bag. Lori, who was bringing the Wizard of Oz, objected, saying that a rock collection wasn't one thing, but several things. It would be like her bringing her entire book collection. I pointed out that Brian's army soldiers were a collection. And anyway, it's not the entire rock collection, just the best ones. Dad, who usually liked debates on questions such as whether a bag of things is one thing, was not in the mood and told me the rocks were too heavy. You can bring one, he said. There are plenty of rocks in Phoenix, Mom added. I picked out a single geode, its insides coated with tiny white crystals, and held it in both hands. As we pulled out, I looked through the rear window for one last glimpse of the depot. Dad had left the upstairs light on, and the small window glowed. I thought of all those other families of miners and prospectors who had come to Battle Mountain, hoping to find gold, and who had to leave town like us when their luck ran out. Dad said he didn't believe in luck, but I did. We'd had a streak of it in Battle Mountain, and I wished it had held. We passed the Green Lantern, with the Christmas lights twinkling over its door, and the Owl Club, with the winking neon owl in a chef's hat, and then we were out in the desert, the lights of Battle Mountain disappearing behind us. In the pitch black night, there was nothing to look at but the road ahead, lit by the car's headlights. Please pause here, write a quick annotation before we move on. Page 91. 
Grandma Smith's big white house had green shutters and was surrounded by eucalyptus trees. Inside were tall French doors and Persian carpets and a huge grand piano that would practically dance when Grandma played her honky-tonk music. Whenever we stayed with Grandma Smith, she brought me into her bedroom and sat me down at the vanity table, which was covered with little pastel-colored bottles of perfumes and powders. While I opened the bottles and sniffed them, she tried to run her long metal comb through my hair, cursing out of the corner of her mouth because it was so tangled. Doesn't that goddamn lazy-ass mother of yours ever comb your hair? She once said. I explained that mom believed children should be responsible for their own grooming. Grandma told me my hair was too long anyway. She put a bowl on my head, cut off all the hair beneath it, and told me I looked like a flapper. That was what grandma used to be, but after she had her two children, mom and her uncle Jim, she became a teacher because she didn't trust anyone else to educate them. She taught in a one-room schoolhouse in a town called Yampy. Mom hated being the teacher's daughter. She also hated the way her mother constantly corrected her, both at home and at school. Grandma Smith had strong opinions about the ways things ought to be done. How to dress, how to talk, how to organize your time, how to cook and keep house, how to manage your finances. And she and Mom fought each other from the beginning. Mom felt that Grandma Smith nagged and badgered, setting rules and punishments for breaking the rules. It drove Mom crazy, and it was the reason she never set rules for us. But I loved Grandma Smith. She was a tall, leathery, broad-shouldered woman with green eyes and a strong jaw. She told me I was her favorite grandchild, and that I was going to grow up to be something special. I even liked all of her rules. I liked how she woke us up every morning at dawn, shouting, Rise and shine, everybody, and insisted we wash our hands and comb our hair before eating breakfast. She made us hot, cream of wheat with real butter, then oversaw us while we cleared the table and washed the dishes. Afterward, she took us all to buy new clothes, and we go to a movie, like Mary Poppins. Now... On the way to Phoenix, I stood up in the back of the car and leaned over the front seat between Mom and Dad. Are we going to go stay with Grandma? I asked. No, Mom said. She looked out the window, but not at anything in particular. Then she said, Grandma's dead. What? I asked. I'd heard her, but I was so thrown I felt like I hadn't. Mom repeated herself, still looking out the window. I glanced back at Lori and Brian, but they were sleeping. Dad was smoking, his eyes on the road. I couldn't believe I'd been sitting there thinking of Grandma Smith, looking forward to eating cream of wheat and having her comb my hair and cuss, and all along she'd been dead. I started hitting Mom on the shoulder, hard, and asking why she hadn't told us. Finally, Dad held down my fist with his free hand, the other holding both his cigarette and the steering wheel, and said, That's enough, Mountain Goat. Mom seemed surprised that I was so upset. Why didn't you tell us? I asked. There didn't seem any point, she said. What happened? Grandma had been only in her 60s, and most people in her family lived until they were about 100. The doctor said she'd die from leukemia, but Mom thought it was radioactive poisoning. The government was always testing nuclear bombs in the desert near the ranch, Mom said. She and Jim used to go out with a Giger counter and find rocks that ticked. They stored them in the basement and used some to make jewelry for Grandma. There's no reason to grieve, Mom said. We've all got to go someday, and Grandma had a life that was longer and fuller than most, she paused. And now, we have a place to live. Mom explained that Grandma Smith had owned two houses, the one she lived in with the green shutters and French doors, and an older house made of adobe in downtown Phoenix. Since Mom was the older of the two children, Grandma Smith had asked her which house she wanted to inherit. The house with the green shutters was more valuable, but Mom had chosen the adobe house. It was near Phoenix's business district, which made it a perfect place for Mom to start an art studio. She'd also inherited some money so she could give up teaching and buy all the art supplies she wanted. She'd been thinking we should move to Phoenix ever since Grandma died a few months back, but Dad had refused to leave Battle Mountain because he was so close to a breakthrough in a cyanide leaching process. And I was, Dad said. Mom gave a sort of laugh. So the trouble you kids got into with Billy Deal was actually a blessing in disguise, she said. My art career is going to flourish in Phoenix. I can feel it. She turned around to look at me. We're off on another adventure, Jeanette Kins. Isn't it wonderful? Mom's eyes were bright. I'm such an excitement addict. Please pause here and write one last annotation.